Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 11th episode of the Gabriel Salim Foundation's live series, Consulting Without Borders Perspectives, in which we talk to international consultants and experts who work to address global challenges, promote excellence, and build a sustainable future. My name is Victoria Olskaya. Uh, I am the president of Gabriel Salim Foundation, uh, which is a US-based nonprofit organization that works internationally. The foundation is dedicated to the remarkable and inspirational life uh, of late Gabriel Al Salim, who was uh, an international consultant and a truly global citizen. Today is March 1st, and uh, according to meteorologists, this is the first day of spring. I know that in some cultures and traditions, spring comes a little bit later on March 20th with the sun uh, equinox. For me, however, uh, I like to think of March 1st as the first day of spring, maybe because I grew up in a, in a cold climate and I was always looking forward to spring. Uh, I'm currently broadcasting from Florida. Here we have eternal summer, no seasons, but still March 1st continues to be a very special day for me. Uh, please uh, let us know in the comments where you are tuning from, how you're doing on, on March 1st, what are your plans for spring. Today we are broadcasting live on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn and Twitter and you can post uh, your comments and your questions directly in the comments of the social media that you're using. We will see those questions and we will post them and answer them. Whichever platform you are joining in from, please hit a like button. This way uh, we'll make sure that more people can see us and join our live stream. Let me see who is already here. Hello, Ron. Thank you very much for joining. He is in Canada, and I know that Ron has been traveling. He made it just in time on the ground to join our, our live stream. Thank you very much. Jana, Jana, hello from Berlin. Thank you so much for joining us. Always great to have you with us. Thank you. Who else is here? Oh, hello from Leiden. Aaron, that must be uh, Anya's colleague, a friend. I'm very happy because Anya, uh, our next speaker, was actually studying in Leiden University. Stephen, Stephen is sending us hello from Bulgaria. I'm glad, Stephen, that you were able to join us. I know that you've also been in transit. I'm glad that, they, that you're here and you can also ask your questions and contribute to our conversation as always. Let me see who else is here. Kenan, hello from Holland. Nice spring day. <laughs> I wonder. And also, hello from Finland, from Katarzyna. Welcome, Katarzyna. Thank you for joining us. And I wonder uh, what the weather is like in Finland on March spring, on, on March 1st. I wonder if it's spring weather or not quite yet. In any case, yeah, thank you very much to everybody who is joining us already at the beginning. I'm sure there will be more people uh, tuning in a little bit later. And also, if somebody cannot join us uh, live, uh, all of these uh, will be recorded and it will stay on the social media uh, that you can access later, which is you know, Facebook or YouTube or whichever social media is convenient for you. I think we got someone else joining us from Kansas. Katarzyna and oh, Katarzyna is answering my question <laughs> about the weather in Finland. So it's uh, 20 centimeters of snow. Well, spring is coming. 
just be patient. I think we have someone else. Michael. Michael is joining us from Vilnius. Welcome and thank you for joining our live stream. Today I am delighted to, to welcome a person who usually is behind the scenes of this broadcast, uh, helping me with the technical side. And I already gave you a hint a little bit earlier who that person could be. Uh, on the other hand, I have to say that it wouldn't be her first time uh, speaking for our foundation because in fact, she is a member of the foundation's board of directors. And she also participated in several conferences talking about sustainability and degrowth. In fact, uh, she is now completing her Master of Science degree in sustainable development in Utrecht University in the Netherlands, as specializing in energy and materials. During the studies, uh, our guest has developed particular interest in the academic discipline and movement of degrowth. And she's currently writing her master's thesis about degrowth of the European aviation industry. I would like to welcome today uh, my and Gabriel's daughter, Anya Al Salim. Hi, Anya. Hi, thank you so Good much to for see having you. me. Good to see Let you. me see. There is more people. Uh, there are more people joining us, uh, saying hello. So I just want to to make sure that we acknowledge that they are with us. Thank you very much. And uh, Anya was just recently with me in Florida, and she left. So I'm very thankful to you, Anya, that you found the time and the energy to prepare for this broadcast and to join us to talk about a very important topic uh, of greenwashing. I know we discussed this for a while and you, for a while you wanted to share the results of the research in which you participated with six other students from the university. And I'm very happy that on, on March 1st, on the first day of spring, you can talk to us about it. And please uh, educate us first on what the growth and the greenwashing, I'm sorry, is and uh, what specifically you, you found out during your research. So I'm giving the stage to Anya. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to finally get the chance to talk about this um, because I think it's a very important uh, topic. And I was also, as you mentioned, involved in some research about it. So. I'm looking forward to sharing um, that today. Um, I have a, a small presentation that I put together uh, for this. So um, I'd like to just start by um, talking about what greenwashing is, because this is a term I think that a lot of us hear, but we don't necessarily maybe know what exactly it's referring to. And here I just um, put kind of the Google dictionary definition of greenwashing, which I think is actually quite accurate, which is, um, misleading or deceptive publicity disseminated by an organization so as to present an environmentally responsible public image. Um, I think a common misconception about greenwashing is that it's necessarily false information. A lot of the times greenwashing isn't actually false. Perhaps the information that's being communicated is true, but it's still misleading. Um, so it's conveying a sustainable public image that doesn't actually match the organization's sustainability performance. So for example, an organization might be emphasizing its green activities while hiding its unsustainable ones and portraying its green activities more sustainable than, as more sustainable than they really are. Um, here I have a small kind of example just to get an idea of what greenwashing is in practice. Um, so here we see uh, an advertisement uh, by KLM, um, which shows the airplane. Um, well, KLM is, is um, the, the, one, like the main Dutch airline. And here we see the airplane with this beautiful uh, natural scenery, um, kind of trying to communicate that the, uh, that the airline is sustainable and engaging in, in efforts to conserve nature, et cetera. Um, 
However, this stands in contrast to the airline's actual you know, activities related to sustainability. Um, for example, a report by Influence Map, which is an independent think tank, uh, think tank, found that European airlines, especially legacy airlines like Air France KLM, are actually leading opponents of European climate legislation. And um, I think this is a very kind of interesting quote from the report, which is that legacy airlines are found to communicate top line support for net zero 2050 ambitions while appearing to oppose key policies to reach this target, particularly efforts to regulate international flights. So clearly here, this is an example of greenwashing because airlines such as KLM try to portray themselves as very sustainable and investing in all these different initiatives, while in reality, behind the scenes, they're actually engaging in very strong efforts to oppose the kind of legislation that would actually lead um, to more sustainability um, because it would be detrimental to their business. So this is um, just, as, yeah, just an example of greenwashing, but of course there are countless examples that you can probably see every day um, in advertising and different uh, media. So that's what greenwashing is, but then why is it dangerous? Um, well, the two main points that I think uh, are important to note are that, first of all, it stalls effective action on climate change um, because polluting companies are seen as uh, already doing their part. Um, and perhaps it, because of this, it can limit some public pressure to more strictly regulate these companies. And also it absolves polluting companies from taking full responsibility for their unsustainable practices. Um, so for, I think an interesting example of this is um, the oil and gas company BP actually was the organization that first introduced this concept of the carbon footprint when they launched their carbon footprint calculator in 2004. Um, and this uh, served to shift the blame for carbon emissions from the company and the industry to individuals. So basically trying to um, yeah, shift the blame and make people feel responsible for carbon emissions, um, when in reality the corporations are the really the driving force behind uh, the emissions. So basically, through greenwashing, um, corporations yeah try to make themselves seem uh, very sustainable and therefore kind of oppose any sort of um, legislation or regulation that could actually um, hurt them financially. Um, now I'd like to focus on a particular case study of greenwashing, um, which then leads into the research that I was a part of at the university. Um, so in 2022, uh, Influence Map, which I mentioned earlier, published another report uh, which evaluated the public communications of the top five oil and gas super majors um, in 2021. And super majors are the largest uh, public, publicly traded and investor owned oil and gas companies. And uh, this report tried to see um, what was the, how did the public communications of the oil and gas companies actually compare to their activities? And, and long story short, the, uh, the answer is that a lot, there's a, a quite a big difference between the communications and the activities of these companies. Um, so the report found that in 2021, 49 to 70% of the public communications uh, of the super majors were about alleged green activities. Um, and only five to 25% of the capital expenditure dedicated uh, was dedicated to green technologies. Uh, and in addition to this, there was heavy lobbying for the expansion of the fossil, of fossil fuel activities. So these um, top five super majors, which you can see here, Chevron, Total Energies, BP, ExxonMobil, and Shell, which are all uh, either European or US based, um, are clearly uh, engaging in um, quite a bit of greenwashing, as probably one can expect. Um, so then building off of this, uh, off of these findings, um, I was engaged in some research um, to see how the public communications of the, the, the super majors that I just mentioned uh, had changed since the invasion of Ukraine in 2022. And this was part of a, a course called the Trans a Transdisciplinary Case Study um, in my master's program, Sustainable Development at Utrecht University, um, where we had the opportunity to actually work on a real life consultancy um, or yeah, research project for, for uh, some clients. So 
I was in a, in a team of six students who are also in the same master's program as me, and we worked in collaboration with our clients, Aaron, uh, Aaron P uh, Pereira and Linda Knuster. Um, and Aaron is here, so thank you so much for joining. Um, and these are the founders of the sustainable, uh, sustainable, sustainability research company, Solid Sustainability Research. And uh, we also worked in collaboration with Influence Map, uh, who published the reports that I had uh, mentioned earlier in the presentation, and also uh, Fossil Free Advertising, which is a citizen's initiative in the Netherlands to ban fossil fuel advertising. So we had a really cool uh, group of people working on this together. And um, what we did was we analyzed all the social media communications of the super majors in the six months following the invasion of Ukraine on February 24th, 2022. And we uh, categorized the, uh, the claims that the super majors made in their public communications according to the narratives these claims um, contained. And um, unfortunately, uh, I don't have time to go into all of the results, um, even though I think, there, yeah, there are a lot of interesting results and um, I will share the link to the report uh, at the end of the presentation, so you're also welcome to go and read it yourself. Um, but I think the most interesting finding um, was for the European super majors, so BP, Chevron, and Shell, um, because uh, we found that after the invasion of Ukraine, European super majors uh, placed a greater emphasis on providing a pragmatic energy mix, for example, through uh, affordable and reliable, reliable energy and also they really emphasized their contribution to the country or the region um, through energy independence or energy leadership, uh, which we called patriotic claims. Um, and the, the, the number of sort of sustainability oriented or green claims that these super majors uh, did kind of stayed the same between um, 2021 and 2022 after the invasion. Um, and let me go to the next slide. Um, oh, no, sorry. I just wanted to mention, just to kind of explain why why we conducted, uh, conducted this research. Um, we were trying to see whether after the invasion of Ukraine, um, the super majors would change their communications in response to um, kind of the increased concerns about energy security um, and uh, maybe increased patriotic public sentiment. And we did find this for the European super majors. For the US super majors, um, there was actually an increase in, in their sustainability related or green claims. Um, and there was not really so much of a difference in their pragmatic energy mix and patriotism claims. Um, and uh, we, we didn't really have the time to look into why there was this difference between the European and US uh, super majors. We had a few high theories about why that could be the case. Um, but basically, we did find uh, that after the after the invasion of, uh, of Ukraine, um, the the sort of emphasis on uh, energy security, energy independence, energy leadership in the, the social media communications of the European super majors did increase. So what does this tell us? This tells us that um, oil and gas companies, uh, particularly these super majors, are very opportunistic in their public communications. They try to portray themselves as good according to the most relevant issues that are going on at the time. Um, so this kind of goes to show that they're not necessarily being honest in their communications, which we kind of already knew because of the degree of greenwashing that we found, but they're just always trying to make themselves um, look good. So that's basically kind of the main outcome of this research. Um, that we found. And we also uh, looked as a, a kind of a, a separate section of the report, we looked into strategies to oppose greenwashing um, to help various initiatives and uh, people and organizations that want to contribute to um, fighting greenwashing. Um, and we um, categorized these uh, strategies based on uh, their estimated direct and indirect impact and the required resources um, that are needed for the different strategies uh, in the form of time, money, and expertise. So the main findings uh, that we had were that local bans on fossil fuel advertising have a high direct impact on companies' ability to greenwash. Um, so these are effective. Um, and also calling out institutions or events sponsored by the fossil fuel industry is also a resource, a resource efficient, although indirect, greenwashing. 
uh, lawsuits against greenwashing, which we've been seeing uh, over the past years, are very effective, but require more time, money, and expertise. So perhaps not, um, yeah, not as uh, easily accessible for everybody. Um, and an effective indirect strategy um, is reporting uh, companies greenwashing to their investors so that the investors can actually put pressure on the companies uh, to disclose their activities and engage in more sustainable uh, policies, which is actually a lot of the work that Influence Map is doing, uh, with whom we collaborated uh, on this research project. Uh, yeah, so that's basically what I wanted to mention about greenwashing in general and uh, the project that I was a part of. Um, this is the link to the full report. It's a bit of a long link, so I am going to paste it in the comment uh, comments. So hopefully that's going to appear um, um, on the different social media pages. And this is um, posted on the website of uh, Aaron and Linda um, of their uh, company, um, where they also published a bit of a summary of the report and, um, and actually included the report there as well, the full report. So yeah, thank you very much for, for listening. Um, uh, thank yeah. you very much, <laughs> Anya. Thank you very much for putting together this uh, information and educating us uh, on what greenwashing is, because uh, I'm sure that we all see it in our everyday life uh, a lot. And sometimes we just don't pay attention, but it would be good to actually understand and be more aware of what is happening. And just sort of to summarize and to put it maybe in uh, simple words that I can understand. So basically greenwashing is when companies uh, falsely claim that they are more environmentally friendly than they they really are, right? Yeah. And yeah, I think, um, I mean, it's really about the discrepancy, at least the way we looked at it in our research. It's really about the discrepancy between um, how sustainable companies say they are and their actual sustainability activities. So when we were looking at the sustainability claims of the different companies on the different social media platforms, it wasn't like they were necessarily lying. Uh, the claims were perhaps true. I mean, we didn't fact check the claims, but we kind of assumed that they were true. It's just that the number of claims that they dedicated to their green uh, activities really um, did not match their investments uh, and lobbying efforts. So that's basically how we define greenwashing in our study. Um, yeah. And I know that you already uh, talked about greenwashing on uh, on the part of large companies such as oil companies, uh, aviation industry, airplanes. But uh, it probably it it is happening in uh, you know smaller companies as well. And just like I said, in our everyday life, we we deal with that. And companies take advantage of the uh, of the fact that people try to become more uh, aware of uh, the climate change and environmental issues of the pollution. So they're just trying to play with our, our minds, right? Mm -hmm. uh, making us believe that they are actually doing uh, you know, more to help you when, when they're not. Uh, I see uh, some questions are coming and actually a question from your uh, colleague at the university, right? Kenan, uh, or am I am I wrong? No, uh, no. Kenan is a, is a friend of mine. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, it's it's a long question, and Kenan, uh, well, you know, thanking you for the lecture and also talking about, uh, as I understand, uh, pollution uh, from the individual side and the company side. So maybe if you can uh, answer his question, uh, that would be great. Yeah. The, the question is about. The question. Yeah. The question is about individual responsibility. Um, so is there also individual greenwashing going on when I, as an individual, fly three times a year, have two cars, eat meat, etc.? cetera? Um, I definitely think, of course, you know, um, doing what you can as an individual is also um, important because, you know, once you um, have a, a large group of people doing something, it can have significant impact and actually, yeah, bottom-up um, change does happen. I just think... Um, it's difficult to put, um, it's, it's not correct to put sort of, to expect individuals to be, to act a certain way within a system that is, that makes it so difficult um, to 
to be actually sustainable. So for example, with aviation, a lot of the times taking a flight is significantly cheaper than taking a train, for example, or um, significantly more convenient because train connections just aren't there. So it's really more of a systemic um, issue than it is an individual issue. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that people shouldn't try as individuals, definitely, but I think it's really more um, at the system level that, um, yeah, that change needs to happen. Um, and in terms of individual greenwashing, I think, I think that's there. It's definitely um, the case that sometimes people say, you know, people kind of t do one easy sustainability-related activity and then think that it justifies them doing a lot of other um, things. So, for example, people who, um, yeah, I don't know, um, don't use plastic straws, but then they um, <laughs> like fly uh, a lot and eat meat, etc. So I think um, there's definitely, uh, it, it's definitely good to educate yourself on what are the most effective things that you as an individual can do while also understanding that um, it is in the end a systemic issue that needs to be, the system has to be changed to actually facilitate um, sustainable behavior. That's been uh, one of the uh, problems or things that actually concern me and Anya because we uh, are in different countries now. She studies in the Netherlands, I'm in the United States, and of course I want to see her as much as possible. And uh, sometimes, uh, well, we are mindful of, you know, traveling and but we also understand that it's unavoidable if we do want to see uh, our family, if we want to, if we need to travel for work. Uh, so what, what we've been trying to do is to at least uh, if we do travel, then stay longer, right, Anya, instead of just doing short trips and also consider the most sustainable way of trying uh, in a way that it's, let's say, a direct flight instead of making you know, many stops and traveling uh, for a short distance. I know, of course, it's just a small drop and but in uh, what we can do. But I also believe that being mindful about these things and at least thinking about them, uh, being aware of them is already uh, is already important and maybe is the first step. But well, yes, on I the one hand, yes. On the other hand, um, at this point, just being aware about something and not doing anything about it is unfortunately not good enough. Um, the, the thing is, aviation is a very difficult one for me personally because, um, well, I'm actually writing my uh, thesis about degrowth of the aviation sector, which uh, maybe I'll talk about a little bit later. But um, while, again, just two days ago, I took a flight from Miami to Amsterdam. <laughs> and it's just, uh, it's a very difficult thing because I, I didn't fly to Miami for fun. I, I flew to see, I mean, I flew for, for fun, but to see my family, not just to go on vacation or something like this. So um, I, I don't want to get too far off topic, but this really relates to this question of human needs and um, how we satisfy those, those needs. So for example, the need of seeing family and being too, close to people that um, yeah, are important to you and uh, that's uh that's an important human need but then for me to satisfy that need i have to fly across the ocean whereas for somebody else to satisfy that need they can just walk a few blocks um to their parents house so it's just uh yeah it's about kind of um i mean i try to justify it to myself in the sense that i do see that I see it as an important need for me to see my family but then i also realize that in the long term it's wouldn't it's not sustainable for people to fly um, in general. So yeah, I feel like a bit of a hypocrite to be honest. Um, but, um, we'll see where, where my research leads me. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Well, we, we are sort of, uh, at this point, uh, under the effect of globalization because yeah, we are, uh, in, in the old days, people used to live in the same village next to each other, generations after generations. Uh, and of course now, things are different so but uh, that's always been a, a little bit of a, a topic for us a problem for us whenever we want to see each other we were just trying to think whether this is uh, the most sustainable way to do it 
So I guess the solution would be to move closer to each other and just and just live in one city or at least one country or at least one continent where traveling can be not necessarily air based. Anya, we actually have quite a bit of questions, so let's yeah. try to answer them. Well, I I put up um, Jana's question, and Jana, thank you for joining us uh, from. Berlin, the city that we all love, and Jean is, is also our family. Uh, Jean is asking about how to distinguish between legitimate uh, claims and greenwashing in advertising. Do you have any tips? Yeah, thank you, Jeanne. That's a, that's a very good question. Um, well, uh, there are definitely, I know about some websites, I think, that are, um, that sort of, um, um, how do you say, like, like uh, evaluate companies uh, based on their uh, sustainability performance. Uh, I don't have any examples off the top of my head um, necessarily, but for example, also the reports. So Influence Map is an organization that, um, yeah, that, that looks at uh, companies uh, such as the oil industry or, or um, the aviation sector um, and uh, actually looks at their um, lobbying and investments and and those kinds of things. So basically, I think um, it, it's just important not to take uh, a claim that you see at face value. Uh, I think maybe just doing a little bit of research um, and not necessarily looking on the company's website because there they're still going to try to portray themselves as um as you know as sustainably as possible so maybe looking at some sort of third party maybe sources of looking at uh how the, the environmental performance of these companies actually is um yeah i, I unfortunately i don't have mm, uh, better uh, advice than that um but i think just yeah just taking every very sustainable, you know, ad that you see with a grain of salt. Yeah. Well, when, when I was I was preparing for this broadcast and also Anya shared with me some of the information that she had, uh, we looked at the examples of uh, how companies other than, let's say, oil companies uh, do greenwashing. And one example uh, is a McDonald's that started this big campaign of replacing plastic straws with paper straws, right? And they've been claiming that this is a huge contribution to reducing pollution. Uh, but in, in reality, uh, the straws that they're using it seems that they're not even recyclable. And so, and also they've been talking about replacing the cups with some something else. And again, it's still using plastic. So just maybe looking a little bit uh, deeper into what the companies are saying they're doing and whether it's actually makes any, any difference. Uh, well, I think, I think that... also looking at the bigger picture because McDonald's, the types of straws that McDonald's uses is like really insignificant compared to their other activities, you know, like where right. they source their meat and all the emissions um, that come from the transportation of the food and all these other things that, in like in the end the straws are very minor so yeah maybe also just trying to look at the bigger picture and if if, if a company is is you know trying to promote how sustainable they are but they're really just focusing on one tiny little thing um that's probably greenwashing uh, also sustainability reporting i think um uh so on on companies websites they actually um have sustainability reports and i think for the most part, they're they're required to be uh, quite accurate in their yeah in their reporting. So I would say maybe that's also a place to look um, uh, because I think they're at, at this point they're required to uh, a lot of companies are required to submit sustainability reports um, and they're not really allowed to lie in those. Although I wouldn't be surprised if they still found a way, but yeah. There is a comment from. Guri Shankar, I know he's joining from India, right? Thank you so much. He posted earlier with uh, regard to my question about the weather. He says that where he is, it's already full summer. So it is quite amazing uh, to have all of you here coming from different parts of the world. 
different climates. Uh, and Guri Shankar actually makes a comment about uh, also the greenwashing doesn't just happen uh, with oil and gas producers, uh, but companies that are closer to the end end user, which is the refineries, uh, chemical producers, and so on. So just like uh, we're saying, uh, greenwashing is not something that only big uh, you know, companies do, or only uh, the, the producers of oil and gas or aviation. This basically goes, every, uh, you know, down the line. Thank you very much for the comment. Thank you, uh, Bakai Zunushov, uh, joining us from Kyrgyz Republic. Yeah, thank you very much, Bakai. Uh, it's really great uh, to see you and. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, that you could join. Thank you uh, for for your question. So basically, uh, Baka is uh, asking about greenwashing uh, in other type of companies, for example, the financial institutions. It, it's, it just happens everywhere. Yeah. Uh, well, for example, case? influence influence map. Um, they also. Um, look at, at financial institutions. So they look at banks, for example, and, and their um, lobbying activities uh, and, and things like that. And their, yeah, uh, actual influence on climate policy. So um, definitely also that's very true that, yeah, greenwashing happens everywhere, really, everywhere you look. Um, yeah, I think um, it may be like a fun activity just to walk walk outside and well, maybe not outside, but somewhere like in the city <laughs> uh, or watch TV and see how much greenwashing um, comes your way because it's really everywhere. That's true. Well, uh, next question comes from Denise. Uh, and uh, in the previous comment, Denise said that he's joining us from uh, sunny Tashkent, uh, Uzbekistan. Uh, thank you for, for joining. Great to have you with us and, and thank you for your question. So Denise is actually asking the question that I was uh, planning to ask you uh, at some point. Uh, since our broadcast and our the activities of the foundation, at least some of the activities are targeting management consultants uh, that work with businesses. Uh, Denise is asking how business consultants uh, can be addressing the problem of greenwashing and these issues uh, on the enter enterprise level. Do you have something to, to say about that, Anya? Yeah, um, well, I think I think it's important to point out to companies that greenwashing is harmful to them as well, especially now that awareness of greenwashing is increasing. Um, so companies can face a lot of criticism if they do greenwash. So for example, H&M, um, this famous um, popular fast fashion brand, um, has attracted a lot of criticism uh, for its claims of having a kind of conscious collection and use of circular materials. Um, while in reality, this actually isn't the case, um, uh, and, and they're also engaged in labor rights violations and, and this recycling scheme that actually encourages more consumption because it offers um, a voucher with a minimum spending amount. So as a result of this, there's been a lot of criticism and this has kind of affected the brand reputation of H&M. And another thing is that companies actually can face lawsuits. Uh, for their greenwashing practices. For example, uh, last year, uh, various Dutch campaign groups, including uh, Reclame Fossil Frei, which is one of the groups that we worked with uh, on the report, um, they filed a lawsuit against KLM for misleading the public about how sustainable their flights are. So, I mean, yeah, greenwashing might be tempting, but it, it really can hurt the organization it's, it, itself. So maybe that's one thing to communicate to these companies. Um, if you're a consultant for them. Thank you. Thank you, Anya, for your great response. Uh, next question comes from uh, Jean, and uh, she is joining us from uh, Kansas. Uh, thank you very much. And the question is about uh, whether governments play any role in uh, holding companies accountable for for, for greenwashing, and you already talked about this a little bit, that uh, governments can actually uh, bring lawsuits against companies. 
Well, right. it's not the governments that necessarily bring the lawsuits. It's usually um, maybe like activist groups. Oh, okay. um, or in the in the case of KLM, or yeah, various Dutch uh, sort of uh, campaign groups that, that did this. Um, well, governments can enforce policies. Um, so stricter regulations on um, what can and cannot be included in advertising. So, for example, again, this KLM lawsuit is um, based on the kind of uh, argument that KLM is actually violating European law with regard to what can, uh, uh, yeah, with their misleading advertising. And another thing that govern uh, governments can do is just to ban advertising of certain industries, uh, which is what uh, Reclame Fossil Fry is actually fighting for. So to ban uh, fossil fuel advertising. I mean, that's not necessarily only related to greenwashing, but that's also a part of it. So if these companies aren't allowed to advertise, they also have much less greenwashing ability. Um, yeah. All right. Well, uh, Katarzyna uh, asking you about Greta Thunberg and greenwashing, and <laughs> I'm not sure <laughs> what 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 exactly Katarzyna means. But uh, well, Greta Thunberg was the advocate uh, for uh, change in environmental policies and so on. Do you know anything about uh, whether she's been uh, active in preventing greenwashing? Um, I mean, I'm very familiar with who, uh, who Greta is. I just, um, uh, I'm not entirely sure if, if maybe there was something recent about her and greenwashing, but not, not that I've, um, heard of, but I think, um, I think in general, any, um, yeah, activists, uh, trying to hold, um, corporations accountable, uh, maybe Katarzyna, if you could maybe, um, maybe explain what you, what you mean in that question, because yeah, I'm also not entirely sure uh, what you're asking. Um, and of course, yeah. So maybe yeah, I, I can and... also, um, I can read the next question from, from Ron. Right. Um, so in recent years, fossil fuel companies have begun to, to rebrand themselves as energy companies with the intention to portray a shift and focus from their fossil fuels to a green future, serving customers with alternative energy products. The reality of the policy lobbying investment history and portion of the business portfolio focused on alternative energy for these companies often tw tells quite a different story. Yeah, exactly. This is also what we, what we well, what Influence Map found in the report that we then built on in our research, but that the um, the branding of the companies often uh, really doesn't match their actual capital expenditure and uh, lobbying efforts. So. Totally agreed. And also that's interesting. Yeah, I know that Ron, you, you've also, um, you're, you're, this is also very uh, relevant to your, your line of work. So um, I'd be curious to talk to you about this <laughs> at some point uh, as well. Uh, I think Katarzyna tried to explain a little bit so about Greta. <laughs> Do you see Greta Thunberg uh, at the other side of greenwashing or is it, is it something else? Um, are you trying to say that 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 Greta has been so sort of using? I'm I'm not sure. Yeah, what the question is. Uh, um, about. Or is she is she using the the same techniques like, or basically, I'm I, I'm not sure what what the question is about. Yeah, I'm I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I think if it, if. Um, yeah, uh, maybe it's something about, like you were saying, it's, it's um, yeah, like greenwashing, but then there's maybe, I mean, I just think that uh, at this point, um, we can't do things like on the terms of um, the big corp, the big polluting corporations. So I think any sort of uh, attempts to call them out and, and hold them responsible are warranted um so uh no matter how extreme they may seem um but yeah i don't know if that if that's related to what you're asking katarzyna um well maybe yeah katarzyna can 
rephrase the question uh, a little bit just to make sure we, we know what, what, uh, what she is trying to ask or comment on. And here is a question from Aaron. Uh, yeah, I think, I think Aaron is just responding to Kanan. Um, ah, okay. Yeah, so uh, Aaron is agreeing with my response, but would also add the aviation's, uh, aviation sector's activities and lobbying, uh, for example, for no tax on aircraft fuel and greenwashing, uh, for example, misleading consumers about flying um about yeah co2 neutral flying drive consumer behavior um with regard to luxury emissions um yeah um yeah i totally agree um I don't know if, uh, what word to add to that, but <laughs> yeah, thank you, Aaron. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't only get questions, we also get uh, comments and our viewers' opinions on the topic. So this is great that they that they feel like they can they can share it with us. Uh, and of course, all these comments they stay. So whoever joins later and watches the replay can see those comments and also perhaps continue the discussion, or at least there will be something that they can think about later um Jeanne, in response to your response to her question about uh, advertising uh so she's thanking you and saying so yeah she'll check the influence map uh it's a great uh it's it's a great you know source of information and yeah I, I mean just just to clarify influence maps um uh, target audience is in the investors who are investing in in different companies um to try to uh I guess, yeah, increase kind of the pressure from investors on these companies um, and try to make them change that way. So, um, but I do think that it's also a, a valuable resource for anybody who wants to know a little bit more about the actual activities of these various um, corporations and financial institutions. Yeah, Stephen, um, I totally agree. Uh, Stephen says, uh, I consider governments also greenwash when reporting policy progress. Absolutely. I think. Um, Governments also set various climate targets and then, um, you know, I mean, I think a very good example of this is uh, the conference of the parties, like the, the COPs that happen, um, where all these different um, world leaders come together and set targets and, you know, um, <laughs> like, get so excited about collaborating um, and working towards sustainability, but then, um, actually translating these uh, claims and promises and goals into action that that's kind of a, a, a big step that a lot of the times isn't made uh, or not made to the full extent um so uh, i completely agree governments are also responsible definitely for greenwashing right and of course still on being uh international consultant working in different countries and working with governments on policy policies uh this approach is probably a response to the previous question about what consultants can do right how they can contribute to perhaps less you know greenwashing activities by companies and uh, this would be this would be one way uh, through reviewing policies and advising yeah. on these policies. Ron comes back to us. Um, yeah, with, uh, uh, he says, more comments. there are more and more companies that advertise themselves as carbon neutral as a way to appeal to their customer base. However, the reality is that to achieve such a claim, the purchase of emission offsets are required as opposed to reduction in emissions. Um, yeah, I think carbon offsetting is extremely pro uh, problematic and also very heavily used by the, avi the aviation industry, um, which, yeah, which I'm also focusing on in my thesis. But uh, the idea that you can continue emitting as long as you invest in uh, projects that supposedly um, kind of counterbalance your emissions. So, for example, reforestation projects is a very common one. Um, uh, it's, it's very tricky. Um, uh, to, uh, to to actually determine whether the offset really happens, um, and a lot of the times it also involves the use of land that, um, uh, yeah, it, often in the global south, um, and perhaps uh, yeah, um, actually taking away land from indigenous communities, etc. So offsetting is a very uh, problematic thing. Uh, 
yeah, I totally agree. Actually, John Oliver has a really good video on offsetting. Um, if anybody wants to check that out, um, yeah. Uh, Katarzyna explained what she meant uh, when she was asking about Greta and greenwashing, and now it's it's I understand what she was trying to say is that there was this uh, act by Greta of traveling to the conference in a boat, but then the boat was actually shipped. Uh, the yacht was shipped by plane. Uh, so uh, would you consider this as, uh, you know, greenwashing? Uh, to, to, uh, to me, uh, maybe this uh, would be more like a, a symbolic thing that, that she did. And if putting it again on the scale of uh, what's more important, I personally think that uh, whatever Greta does is... Uh, is is great and the fact uh, that she is such a young but very influential advocate for uh, the problems with climate change and the environment and just like we said before sometimes we we have to put on the scale I guess uh, of uh, whether we we need to travel and how we travel and in this case it was for me it was more like a symbolic uh, statement on on her part which was uh quite uh important i i would say maybe some people would disagree i know that uh poor greta uh actually had to deal with a lot of you know criticism but i personally think that she is uh, very sincere and you know, genuine in what she's trying to achieve as a young person what do you think anya yeah i i agree with you uh to be completely honest i uh, the, the the thing about it being shipped by plane, I I don't know a lot of the details about um, that <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, so I I'm not sure if that's true or not. But if it is the case, I also agree with my mom that um, uh, yeah, that it's more of a symbolic act, uh, and I I do support um, Greta's activism. Uh, more from Ron. Yeah, uh -huh. Ron is asking whether um, we've analyzed greenwashing by government bodies. Um, and he's talking about how the, gov the government of Canada has signed a number of international agreements um, to reduce emissions while continuing to re rely on fossil fuels uh, and lagging and passing national legislation to achieve the reduction targets in a meaningful way. Um, we did not look at uh, government bodies. We had a very limited time uh, and a very kind of specific focus of the research looking at these super majors um, and comparing the results of what we found in their communications to what Influence Map found in their report, uh, in their previous report. So we really just focused on these five oil and gas companies. Um, but um, there's actually a, a website, uh, it's called Climate Action Tracker, I think. Uh, let me quickly, I don't want to say the wrong name. Um, let me see. I think, yeah. Um, but this, yeah, so it basically, uh, this, this, this actually does um, look at different countries and um, gives kind of profiles of each country and um and actually ranks them according or not ranks but but evaluates them according to their uh climate policy and um and their so it kind of shows their their goals and whether they're on track to meet those goals and whether those goals are actually in line with international um agreements uh the paris agreement um so i think this is a really good resource to sort of see uh whether the country itself is uh yeah whether the government is doing a good job or not um so i'm looking at the us right now and it's uh insufficient the overall rating is insufficient um mm -hmm. so yeah i don't think that's a surprise but <laughs> um <laughs> right. yeah. it's called climate action tracker if anybody wants to check it out thank you anya well, yeah, just to complete our conversation about Greta, Katajin explains further, basically what she meant is that sometimes activists, they also in, in, get involved in 
greenwashing. Uh, so basically saying that uh, greenwashing is everywhere. Uh, and again, just like I, I mentioned to me, uh, we, we all have to balance at least at, at, at this point in our life. Sometimes there are just simply no alternatives. I think Greta's activism is probably more important than the fact that her boat was shipped by plane. Uh, and Ron actually comments on that. He says, yeah, that she also traveled uh, by train to other conferences and generally walks the walk, uh, which I, I agree with. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I also just think, um, again, like I mentioned earlier, it is a systemic, uh, these issues that we're talking about are really systemic issues. And so I think it's kind of unfair to look at, um, you know, blame an activist or not, sorry, I don't want to use maybe harsh language, but I, I think it's um, maybe, I think we have to be understanding that even climate activists live in this world where it's um, a lot of the times very difficult to actually do this, make the sustainable choice um, because of the systemic uh, constraints. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I also agree with Ron and with my, my mom. Yeah, and just like like we said, uh, we try to be very considerate and mindful of uh, traveling by air, for example. But sometimes there is there is no choice uh, if you want to see your family. So I mean, there is a choice technically. Um, I could, you know, theoretically take a boat. It's just that, again, according like uh, under the circumstances um, and the, also again like the lifestyles that we lead, it's very difficult to just get on a boat for a month and you know it's it's just uh, yeah again it comes down to the sort of fundamental way that our society operates I think. all right well i think uh we came to the end of the questions and we are pretty much uh on the hour uh so uh, anya uh, i know we had a few other things we wanted to talk about but uh, probably at this point, uh, we'll just leave it for the next uh, discussion uh, where you can maybe at some point also tell us more about your research into the aviation industry when that research is more complete. That would be great to hear the results. Uh, so, yeah, I just, I'm very proud of you. And I know that Gabriel, your, your papa, would also be very proud of what you're doing and what kind of a great person you you are becoming and you know have become so uh i i know you don't have yet any any set plans for the future and we've been talking about it you're still just working on your thesis and enjoying your student life but just maybe uh, as, a, as a wrap up uh what would you consider doing and i know it's still a very very open question but just and we keep talking about it and you don't know, but just uh, in this area, what what do you think you, you might end up end up doing after you graduate? Um, well, I actually, I, I don't think I'll end up working. I mean, I think it's easier for me to say what I don't think I'll do than what I will necessarily do, but I think I, I won't end up working for a corporation. That's at least my plan. <laughs> because I think uh, in, at the end of the day, yeah, we can't do it on their terms uh, anymore. It can't be like a win-win situation uh, for corporations in terms of actually taking um, sufficient action uh, on climate change. So yeah, I think the pressure has to come from the outside. Um, and especially because I am an advocate or, and I, I support degrowth, which um, I think corporations, it just doesn't align with anything that they would want because um, it would basically mean that they would have to reduce or, yeah, grow, um, stop growing and actually get smaller, which doesn't fit with this, yeah, with their drive for, for profit. So um, basically, I don't think I'll work for a corporation. Uh, I also don't think I'll work for the government. Um, I think it's more, more likely that I will work um, maybe with a, a small organization, um, maybe conduct doing the kind of work that I've already been doing, um, conducting research, um, um, because that's what I know how to do at this point. <laughs> and um, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll go from there. But I, I find it really important to sort of shed light on um, 
the realities of, uh, again, the fossil fuel industry, um, but also, uh, yeah, kind of, kind of just going behind, uh, beyond the, the claims um, that corporations and governments put out um, that sort of maintain the status quo and sort of communicate the idea that more radical change is needed. Thank you, Anya. Would you consider becoming a consultant in, in, a, in a broad sense and the, the broad meaning of this word and the profession? Um, um, Sorry. <laughs> I, thought, I thought, yeah, we, we uh, I thought you, you, yeah, we actually, I know we, we wanted to talk a little bit about how consultants can, uh, uh, you know, fight greenwashing but and i guess that's 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 a very important important thing when consultants work with the companies that they have to work with but is this something that you might be interested in in doing i mean i don't think i would again consult um uh, like shell for example um <laughs> You don't because, want to go f f no because the big I don't oil want to, gas companies. I don't want to contribute to uh, more greenwashing. But I, I guess, I guess, I, to be honest, I don't know because the, the 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 definition of consulting can be very broad. I mean, technically, the project that we were working on with um, our clients uh, on the um, uh, change in public communications of the super majors after the invasion of Ukraine. That was also, I guess, technically a consulting project because this was a consulting course, but it didn't really feel like a consulting project. It felt more just kind of an, like an independent research project. So um, I, I guess if that's, if that's considered consulting, I would be interested in doing that. But uh, yeah, I, I, I don't, I think I see my, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, that's, that's okay too. You, yeah. you just uh, enjoy your studies. Uh, you're doing such great work already and uh, you're still, of course, so young. And of course, there are all sorts of opportunities ahead of you. Thank you so much again uh, for doing this, uh, this episode with uh, Consulting Without Borders Perspectives. It's always great to have you, Anya, on our uh, events, online and in-person events. You've already contributed so much to the foundation. And just like I said before, I know uh, Gabriel would be so proud of you. You're definitely going into his, in his steps. Maybe not exactly what you will end up doing what he was doing, but it doesn't matter. Uh, you are a global citizen and you are doing the best for this world and for building a sustainable future. Thank you very much. And thank you, of course, to everybody who joined us today and asked wonderful questions, uh, added uh, great comments. Uh, thank you. Thank you uh, for joining us from all around the world and finding the time in your in your morning. I know for Ron, it's awfully early and he just arrived in Canada. And for some people, it's already late. So I really appreciate that. And please uh, follow our announcements on the foundation's website. Uh, and I think Anya at this point can help us um, put the foundation's website. Yes, I'm handling everything myself today since Anya is a speaker today. And so I, I have to apologize no, I <laughs> for being anyway, uh, a little bit yeah. slow. Um, so actually, Bakai uh, is commenting uh, and giving you advice that you might be benef ben that you might benefit uh, from working with um, inside uh, corporations and governments before becoming a consultant. <laughs> That's the advice from someone who, who's been there, who's been doing a lot of consulting, a lot of work with uh, big international organizations. So something to consider. Thank you, Bakai. Uh, there was a question from Ron. Yeah, thanking you for the insights. And also Michael uh, Brazian, who joined us from Vilnius, uh, if I remember correctly, he's also thanking you for all the information and the insights. And again, uh, our next episode will be on April 
first, exactly in one month from now, same time at, at 1 p.m. or 13 hour uh, Greenwich Mean Time. This is the best time that we think uh, for all of us so that our viewers can join us from anywhere in the world. I know it's still not maybe the most convenient time for, for certain countries, but that's the best we can do. So please follow our announcements uh, on the website and social media about the next speaker and the next topic. And I thank you, Anya, uh, and I will let you go. But before I disappear and say goodbye, I just wanted to, to, to say a few words um, about the award, International Award for Excellence in Consulting. Uh, some of you might know that our, our foundation launched this award in 2011, and we've been pretty consistent running it year after year. Well, uh, we usually announced our winners on February 1st, which is Gabriel's birthday, and on this day we usually have a conference. It used to be in-person conference, now it's been an uh, online conference. Uh, this year we decided to do things a little bit differently and perhaps be more flexible with the dates. So we are accepting applications for the International Award for Excellence in Consulting uh, uh, until basically in two rounds. So we are accepting them on the continuous basis. And the first deadline that we set up is April 15th with the expectation that our award international committee will um, make uh, the selection and uh, uh, announce the winners uh, in mid-May. So that's our plan. And then there, there will possibly be another round of awards later in the year uh, with the announcements and the presentation of the awards uh, done on, on February 1st. You can find all of the information about this international award uh, for excellence in consulting on our website. Uh, it's all there, including the form that needs to be completed. I also would like to uh, say that this year we are also doing special award, which we called Awards for Ukraine. And this award, uh, all of the information is also on the website. Same a deadline for applications, which is April 15th. And in this award, we want to recognize companies and organizations making positive contribution to Ukraine's economy and a victory. We think this is very important. Uh, and so we are you know, welcoming nominations for this award. Again, all of the information is on the website. And please uh, uh, check it out. And please send us your applications. Our award international committee will be very happy to read the submissions and contact you if they have any questions. And we're looking forward to selecting our winners. Uh, the, the website information also uh, talks about uh, eligibility criteria, evaluation process, and the benefits that we would like to offer all the winners as the foundation. Thank you very much again for staying with us. Please join us on April 1st. And this is all for now. I wish you all the very best and have a great you know, rest of your day. Goodbye.